Dianita Singh, whose works are surrounding us, this fantastic show which opened a couple of weeks ago at Dream Villa. Um, Dianita is also back here because there is a show opening at the Serpentine Gallery of many distinguished artists, some of whom are here tonight and I welcome them all. Um, please do have a look at the show afterwards. There's some fantastic works downstairs of Dianita's and some publications here, which I hope Dianita might do a bit of signing later. Um, the most recent, which was published by Steidl, who I hope are coming later. But um, thank you both very much, and I'll pass over to you, Jeff. Great, thank you, Jane, and thank you all for coming. Um, I was really happy to do this because, of course, it's a condition of being friends with somebody that you're, you never get to speak to them seriously about what, what they do. Um, so really, I'm just going to indulge myself and ask Dianita all the things that I felt I haven't asked, been able to ask when we've just been in a, in a social situation. And uh, okay, so we're in the middle of this, uh, this great uh, exhibition of her new color work. And the thing is, my first question is such a huge question, really, that I suspect after asking it, I can just put my feet up and sit back for the rest of the evening, because it'll require a big answer. I mean, as many of you will know, <clears throat> there was a, it took a long time before color photography in the West got institutional acceptance. Various times, all the big names in photography were anti-color, so you know, we can go through them. Edward Weston, Walker Evans, Walker Frank, uh, Robert Frank, Cartier-Bresson, they were all anti-color. They were insistent that black and white were the colors of serious photography. And then, as you all know, that all changed with the, um, <clears throat> with the big William Eggleston show at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in, in New York in the 70s. And a whole load of people were, were getting into color Con contemporaneously with, with Eggleston, but that was the, that's kind of widely regarded as the, the big paradigm shift. <clears throat> okay. And the uh, photographer, the Indian photographer, Raghubia Singh, was talking about this, and he said, yeah, there was all this theoretical wrangling and all this fussing and hand-wringing and all this kind of stuff. Then he said, you know, if the camera had been invented in India, there'd have been none of this. We'd have started in color. And I suppose the, so my question is this really, um, you know, in a way, it's taken you a long while to, to get into color, but you've really got into it now. So I just, you know, tell us about how you, how you, got, in, how you got into color and how you feel about that, uh, that I think that great comment by Raghubia Singh. I don't agree with him, but I have to say that Raghubir is a great reference for me in this work, and because Raghubir had done <coughs> such formidable work in color in India, I, I thought that's it, that's the only way to photograph in color in India. And so I had no interest in, I never thought I would photograph in color. Raghubir was a big reference of what not to do. And so almost by accident, I. Uh, you, I had a color roll and I thought I was shooting in black and white and then I looked at the contact sheets and there was a blue cast over it. There were still black and white pictures. They looked like black and white pictures with a blue filter. And of course I'd used the wrong film and I got interested in that blue light. And then I started to get very interested in the full moon and darkness. But really I thought something is happening for me but I never, never thought it would amount to anything. It was just a little secret project that I was keeping going. And when this particular work started, Dream Villa, um, I was, I had had, um, on the full moon of May 2007, I had a terrible robbery in my house in Goa. And that's the first 30 rolls of Dream Villa were stolen. Oh, the robbers came and took uh, what they, they took all my used film and left the new film. So they took a bangle, a silver bangle that said, go away closer. 
It was like someone said, like a Sophie Carl uh, robbery. It was very specific. And I said to the police, this is as though someone has given them a list of how to destroy me. I mean, it's the worst thing you can do to a photographer is to take their used film. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, a ring that I had worn for many years, a watch that I'd worn for a decade, but not something that looked like diamond earrings, not my iPod, not my computer. And I was very upset, of course, about losing this film. And I think it was that night that I went and made that picture of the moon behind those trees because I thought I have to, I have to continue photographing. It'll be a terrible defeat if these robbers have... And I don't know if it's from that, but the, the color work started to feel completely different from the black and white as uh, a body of work happens to be in color, but it was as though uh, nothing was quite as it seemed, that the world is not such a comfortable place anymore, that things are topsy-turvy, and I guess some of the terror from that night came through in the work. Um, I was just reminded of that recently. It wasn't an active thing, so even when I was here for the opening, I, w I hadn't really connected the two, but I was thinking about it after I went back. And I think that's why perhaps, uh, not that's why, but that's sort of the background to this body of work that you're seeing here. And before then, you'd not even, you'd not even mucked around with color, really. I briefly did something called the Blue Series, because then when I saw what happens to what I thought was black and white film, uh, shot in the wrong light. Um, I was quite intrigued by that blue. So there's a book of postcards that should have been ready today by Steidl uh, of the blue work. Huh. And then Dream Villa followed. Yeah, well, do you want to say something about the title? Dream, I always lo love your title. So what, what is the, what is the, what or where is the Dream Villa? Um, Actually, it's, it's in end. my head. <laughs> um, it's, I know it. When I go meet a person or I see a tree or a building, I know this is a candidate for Dream Villa. So weeks could go by and nothing emerges. And then suddenly I see the person and I know that's Dream Villa. In doing the work, I was feeling this has something to do with dreams, more like a nightmare. And then two in the morning, with a furious taxi driver, I do drove past Baligan Circular Road, and there it was, Dream Villa. Uh -huh. So I thought, that's a message, and that's the title. And when you say you meet somebody, or you see a place, and you, say, and, and you think, that's Dream Villa, does that mean, oh, that, that's in color? Or is there a, can, can the Dream Villa exist in black and white? I think there are beginnings of uh, Dream Villa in the black and white, in a few landscapes. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's completely disconnected, but now when I think Dream Villa, I think color. Yeah, yeah, because it's really, I mean, when, I think it seems to me when you start off in any working, in any, whether you're, you know, a writer or whatever, you've got all these ideas and you don't know which form is appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, as you get, as you get going, typically that, that gets easier. Now, now are you in the kind of tricky thing that you, you, you see something and, it, you know, you could do, it could be color, it could be black and white, because it's not like you've stopped doing black and white, is it? No, I, I do black and white by day and color by night. Oh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's simple, yeah. And um, do I understand? Did I understand you correctly, that you feel there's something quite, not exactly frightening isn't the word you used, but you sort of... Uncomfortable. Yeah, as a, you know, you, you were talking about the, the robbery, and I just wonder about, and these, there's nothing, to me, there's nothing unsettling about these. I mean, they're dark, a lot of them, but they're mm. rather, there's something, but I mean, I mean the word, the adjectives that, spring to mind, the words that spring to mind. I mean, there's a kind of, yeah, there's a magical, enchanted quality, but I don't see any, any hint of threat in them. Maybe that's just me being dim, but I mean, they're just sort of, to me, they're, they're kind of lovely and magical, enchanted, rather than nightmarish. 
But for you, they definitely have that, that quality of unease. Yeah, like that, that red poem there. Well, obviously, this isn't a democracy. We can't put it to the vote, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, that's just a, no. Actually, I should clarify. Compared to the black and white that I felt always offered solace, um, it was more um, comforting, even if it was about sadness and loss and absence. That there was a comforting quality to it. And I don't see that comforting quality in the colour, yeah, in this yeah. colour. It's funny, you see, because those, that series over there, I mean, if that to me, because I guess I'm so, just being really stupid, but it, they're red, oh, they look quite cosy to me. <laughs> um, and you, so these are, I mean, so you, that's, that's a little kind of narrative or series mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. Then that's a, is, is that how it's, I mean, it's, it's, um, this exhibition is made up of a number of distinct little cantos or whatever you call them within the, the larger thing of the... Yeah, little poems. Little poems, you call them, yeah. Yes. And is there... Uh, what about the, the narrative word? How do you feel about that? Do you feel this is some kind of narrative? The I, I don't like the narrative word. Um, I'm hoping that the work just makes a few suggestions and has a few hints, and then people will make their own narrative. I'm yeah, hoping yeah. that there's no explicit narrative in the work. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to get away from that for a while. That's interesting, because it seems to me there's something else. I mean, it's um, some of the first f uh, photographs of India that I became really interested in were the... Um, the Michael Ackerman Varanasi mm. pictures. And I don't know if you know Ackerman's work, but his most recent book is called uh, Fiction. And there's a couple of lines at, in the interview at the end of that, which I keep coming back to. First of all, he says, um, you know, he travels, he travels a lot. So it's, um, you know, he's not, a, he's not a completely sort of solipsistic character. There's this great line when he says, you know, as far as I'm concerned, places don't exist. A place mm. is just my idea of it. Mm. Which is quite a, it would be quite a, an extreme thing for a writer to say. It's even more far out for a photographer to mm. say, I think. And then he said, you know, and in fact, really what I'm trying, and you know, this is implicit in the title of his book. He says, you know, I'm really, I'm trying to get, get, get rid of all the content from my pictures. In fact, in a picture of the road, I want to get rid of the road. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you've, gone in a similar, if there's a similar Absolutely. kind of trajectory, and it seems to me you've, you're moving, you can see it from privacy, let's say, is really quite documentary, you mm -hmm. seem to be moving further and further away from, well, from documentary into something much more lyrical, poetic, Fiction-like. Yeah. I'm thrilled to hear that Michael Ackerman is thinking that as well, and what I find Annoying in photography is people always want to know where it was taken and yeah. when it was taken, as though that's the most important thing. And maybe historically it is, but um, it sort of puts it into a little box and then you feel you can close the book, I've got it, that's Padmanabhapuram, perfect, over. Mm -hmm. And I find, like, with Go Away Closer, when there weren't any titles, and there wasn't any time, it didn't say something is from 2006, then people had to actually find their own vocabulary mm -hmm. to talk about the work. So the same image would be described by different people differently. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it's very active now to get away both from place and from time, and I think darkness is a great ally in that. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's... Well, as I said, I'm here to satisfy my own curiosity, though. So, I mean, could you bear to say ab about where some, where, where some of these, where most of them were taken? <laughs> just, just, just yeah. between the two of us. <coughs> what about that one? <laughs> what, what difference does it make to you if I told you this was Goa or London or Calcutta, other than That's just giving it a label and closing it? Yes, I mean, but that, that just, I mean, that's quite a big thing. I mean, it's, I mean, it's really, I, I like what you're doing. Um, 
we all have this curiosity. I bet we all want to know, you know, we're all curious. And I can see how it's great to not have that very simple desire satisfied. Mm. Um, okay, I mean, are they all taken in India, roughly? That's not narrowing it down too much. That's the category that I dislike the most. Ah, okay. <laughs> Earth, would you say, <laughs> just to keep it really... Uh, um, I think a lot of them are in my head. Yeah, that's really interesting, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> it was funny when I came to the opening. Do you remember I was walking around with that friend of mine, Steve, who's a mm. photographer, so I was looking at them just thinking, cool, those are nice colours, and oh, isn't that, <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that pretty and everything? And he, and he was saying to me, oh, that one she's used, uh, she's, uh, you know, she's used outdoor, indoor film, or whatever it is, that she's pushed, blah, blah. So he was, um, he's aware that there are all sorts of technical tricks and stuff that photographers can do. And I think the, one of the things that I loved about that, it was a bit like listening to Christopher Ricks on Dylan, in that I felt fairly sure, I, I got the impression that he knew rather more about what you were doing technically than maybe you did. And I really got the impression that sometimes with, uh, so I suppose this is, I mean, just how, okay, so you said how it all started out as a bit of an accident, but <clears throat> by now, do you know what, how they're gonna turn out, or do you kind of, you know, do you get to see them and you think, wow, that's a Yes, it's shit, much more that like that. Well. And there's lots of, oh no, oh no, this is not Dreamville, I thought it might be, it's not, it's not. Ah, there it is. <laughs> And I think I'll only do this work till that remains. And once I become uh -huh. like Steve and I understand what happens to this light at that time, uh, it'll become a formula then and then I won't do it. So actually, this, it isn't quite true what you were saying earlier on when you say you, uh, you meet a person or you see a place and you think, ah, oh, that's Dream Villa. Yeah. In fact, it only becomes a Dream Villa thing that's true. in the yeah. dark room or, or later. Yeah. Uh -huh. When I look at the contact sheet. Yeah, yeah. And there was a bit of trying to, because of digital, I thought, if I'm going to work in color, I want to see how far I can push that daylight film and what happens to daylight film. And it's still a wonderful surprise when I get my contact sheets back. And often it's all dud after dud. And then suddenly, and I thought all of them are Dream Villa. Yeah. But it's in the contact sheet. Yeah, You're right, yeah. Jeff. And and so let's say so with let's say this one here with that lovely blue sky and the kind mm -hmm. of green i mean so you just were you hoping to get that kind of amazing amazing blue or uh no you know, we could well i sort of knew that it would be an interesting blue because of the time of day mm. but i had never because i hadn't been really um concentrating on artificial light at night I didn't realize that it would translate like this. It's a father mm. trying to photograph his son. So it's the focus light from the camera. And once you start looking at what happens to the car tail lights yeah, next to the yeah. person who's driving, so it, it, it's like a, it's an adventure. It's something new for me. Mm -hmm. And if I, Yes, like I said before, that once I understand all, what all the different artificial lights do, then it'll become boring. Then, yeah, yeah. Whereas with black and white, you have, do you feel you've got absolute technical mastery whereby, you know, it's, it's, it's so deeply part of you that it's almost instinctive? Mm, yes, um, yes. Yeah, there isn't that kind of surprise uh, in how the image turns out. But yeah. with using the wrong film and all this artificial light, not knowing how different halogens will translate, um, I never quite know what's going to come out till I look <laughs> at the contact sheet. And do you want to say something about the, the big red picture, which is, I can't remember, is it in that office there? In Jane's office. Yeah, because that's really, that's an amazing, great kind of slur of red you've got there. What did, uh, what was going on with that one? It was the tail light. Oh yeah, was that all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Yeah, because he, you know, there's that lovely mohoinage thing when he talks about a spontaneous color experience. Mm. And that's really what we keep getting in these, I think. I, mm. I think, and I love this idea that once you get the ha once you once you get the hang of color, you'll be through with it, kind of thing. Once yeah, unless I find something else. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Um, so do you so do you have any sense of where where you're going next? What what you're going to do next? in terms of, I mean, are we going to go further and further into this kind of dream world with less and less reference to the... Uh, That's becoming very important, to take that reference away. The where and the when. Yeah, yeah, I see that. And what it is. So it's almost as though the photograph is outside what I've photographed. Yeah. It maybe is here or there mm. or there. Okay. Um, this is a slightly different point. I can't remember, it was during Photo London, and there was a, a little kind of seminar or something on contemporary Indian photography. So I went along to that, and it was, a lot of the stuff they mentioned, it was, um, it was all very, um, oh, it all felt it was coming out of a kind of cultural studies program, <laughs> if you like. It was all very, um, you know, it was all very sort of discursively informed, and it was all, I mean, yeah, it was all that, that kind of stuff. It had a very big, it, it dragged an awful lot of theoretical baggage with it. <coughs> and they were talking about, you know, some of the uh, in Indian photographers, and, um, well, I, I don't want this to seem like I'm being rude, but the thing is, uh, they, they didn't mention you. And in that context, actually, I'm not surprised, mm -hmm. because it seems to me this is this hasn't got that kind of um, that, that kind of thing, and I just wondered how. Uh, this is me asking completely in my ignorance wh where where you fit in to contemporary Indian photographic uh, practice, or are you just this kind of you know weird crazy loner doing her mad color stuff that she doesn't understand? <laughs> um, I I don't know where I fit in. Um, I'm very happy not to fit in and very happy not to be part of the kind of debate um, you were talking about mm. and I've made that quite clear um, <coughs> to the people that were having the debate <laughs> <laughs> um, because of the where and when of photography. Mm, mm. You know, this work is important because of such and such thing but there are other emotions attached to what one does in photography that are not don't fulfill any social scientist uh, objective. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the, say with Go Away Closer, the, not, not much interest in, say, exploring loss, but more important in where is the picture and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So I, I try to, where, where I fit into Indian contemporary photography is really difficult for me to say. And I'm not even sure I want to fit into contemporary Indian photography. I'm much more, uh, my dialogue, for example, is much more with my writer friends. Um, mm. The few people I pay very close attention to in, say, doing this work um, happen to be writers. Yeah. So there's... Which the one's apart, apart from me, obviously? I can't <laughs> name them. <laughs> well, some of them, like Calvino, for example. Oh, Not that really? I'm having yeah. an active conversation with him, but reading Calvino has informed a lot of my work. Mm. Um, Ondace definitely uh, influenced very much the sequencing and editing of Centre Letter and this work. Yeah. You know how in Running in the Family, this is Michael Undace, the great writer, describes going for a wedding. And there's a build-up to uh, this wedding. But on the way, they have a puncture, and then there's a picnic. And you never read about the wedding again in the book. <laughs> but yeah, that was yeah. main part of the plot for a certain time. I'm possibly simplifying Undace too much. Uh, but... When a ph younger photographers ask me what they should read, the first thing I give them 
for 300 rupees is ongoing moment. And then I suggest uh, running in the family yeah. of Undace and difficult loves of uh, Calvino, especially the chapter yeah. on adventures of a photographer, yeah, yeah. which I think should really be one of the most important mm -hmm. pieces in writing on photography, Sure. Yeah. as I do in Coming Through Slaughter, the chapter that uh, Undace has on Belloc. On Belloc, yeah, sure. Um, and music. So it's, it's really somewhere between music and writing. Yeah. Um, I often talk about the work as reading the work. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, but it's something that never ceases to uh, um, amaze me about uh, photographers. You know, it's, um, you know it's, there's no reason at all, it seems to me, why photographers need to be to be particularly clever, you know, it's, you know, you can be, Jeff. You, you know, you just press the button, you know, and there's no reason why they should be well read, but so many of them are, A, incredibly clever, and B, are amazingly well read, you know, Lee Friedlander has read everything, you know, and it's, um, it's just really interesting, that, I think, this, uh, that, that, that you, that, um, yeah, it's just interesting. But music, you mentioned music, so I've got here this very <laughs> rare book. This is Dionysus' first book. That's so unfair of you. I do yeah. everything to hide this book from every CV. Well, it's got some great pictures in it, if you like Zakia Hussein. Um, and, um, yeah, so it's his, uh, did you, this it's came out of your student days, didn't yes, it? Yes, it's my student project from 1986. Well, that's not bad for a student, is it? Um, and, yeah, I was going to ask you about, actually, one, I think I landed in Delhi Airport, and there was this huge, fantastic picture of, uh, of uh, Zakia Hussein and, Usta, and his dad, Ustad al -Araka. I think I probably can't put my, can't turn, anyway, it's this beautiful picture, blown up, really huge, actually. I thought, God, that's a terrific picture. And then I looked close, it's, for, it's an advert for HSBC or something. And then I look closer and it's, it's, you know, photographed by Dianita Singh. So obviously the question I really, here it is, that's it, that's it. Obviously I kind of, one question is, well, how much did you get for that from, from the HSBC? Uh, but also just generally, given that music has been such a, Indian classical music has been such a, a, a big part of your life, and you, you've talked so nicely about, um, uh, about the writers that have influenced you and, I'm always interested in this thing of uh, the extent to which one art form can apprehend or depict another. So, what, yeah, could you just say more about uh, music and, and Well, since you brought up Zakir, I think he's the reason that I'm a photographer. Hmm. Um, I had no interest in photography because I was so <coughs> photographed by my mother that I thought photography is one of the most irritating things to have around childhood, certainly. And so I was studying graphic design to be a typographer. Uh, no interest in photography. I had to do a little class assignment on <coughs> moods of a person. And this was 81. And I knew Zakir Hussain makes a lot of faces when he plays, so I thought, very easy, go take the pictures, get on the overnight train to Bombay, party all weekend, and come back on Monday and give the film in, and I'm done while everybody else is slaving away over their moods of a person. So I stood up to take a picture, and the organizer pushed me, and I fell on my backside. I was 18, my pride was furiously injured, and I stood outside the concert hall and very embarrassed, sort of trembling with rage, and then Zakir came out of the concert. He wasn't such a star at that time. After the concert was over, he came out and I said, put my hands like that, and I said, Mr. Hussain, I'm a young student today, but someday I'll be an important photographer, and then we'll see. <laughs> and I started crying out of anger. And so he sat down, got me some water, and he said, what's the problem? And I said, well, I wanted to do my class assignment, and I need to go to Bombay tonight, and..." You know, the organizer stopped me, and it's a public concert. I have every right to photograph. He said, well, you should have got permission before. Ravi Shankar had added a fret to his sitar, an extra fret. 
And so he didn't want to document it because he was still experimenting with it. And that's why I was stopped. <laughs> and then he said, if you want to photograph me, uh, you could come to the hotel in the morning and photograph me when I'm rehearsing. It's, you just want all these expressions. And that was the most important night of my life, I think. Uh, <laughs> staying up with friends, trying to decide. Girl from a good family, going to a musician's hotel room. Yeah. Um, How was it? <laughs> to do or not to do. And my friends and me decided that we couldn't really bother about what people will say. Yeah. And so I went and six winters traveled with Zakir and the other musicians. And that's really my learning in photography. My, I don't think my photography learning comes from studying photo history yeah, or looking yeah. at other photographs. And Zakir was really like a guru, always forcing me mm. to focus. I wanted to learn the flute from Hariji. I wanted to be a masseur. And he said, no, 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 you've decided photography and you have to keep focusing on that. And just spending all that time with musicians, and you know how a rag builds up, that informs my editing as well. Yeah. That very slow beginning, but most of all what I learned from the musicians is when to stop, yeah. just before it becomes too much. So you want another page, you want, another, uh, you want Hariji to play another little piece, yes, yeah. or at least in those days it was like that. Yeah. So I think editing, sequencing, which I think is the most important part of photography and not the picture taking, mm -hmm. um, really was informed by music, music <coughs> and writing. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, to go back to that, <coughs> that big, so we saw this big picture of Zakir Hussein and, and his dad. Huge picture, really. And, <coughs> I mean, really, one of, so many photographers now, as you all know, they've gone really big. You know, <laughs> a lot of them are on the, on the Gursky trip because it's, um, well, it's, it's technologically possible now to do bigger pictures than ever before. And similarly with photography books, I mean, you know, they're more and more lavish and, um, you know, uh, uh, and just big things. And um, I mean, <coughs> there's, a, there's always, I mean, in Dianita's uh, apartment in Delhi, there's lots of these little kind of ho homemade little albums that you've done. And even your kind of professional, uh, and if you can consider the size and stuff of most photography books, I mean, there's, here's a, this is go away closer. So there's this nice kind of down home sort of cottage industry quality to, to what you do. And it, even looking around this, uh, this, uh, you know, this exhibition, typically, <coughs> of course, in a, in a gallery context, the frame is, is very important. And you can imagine the, the kind of gallerist saying to a, to a punter who's not sure, you know, shall I, shall I, shan't I? You know, saying, oh yeah, it, it includes the frame and it's, because the idea is, you know, what you don't want the punter to think is they're shelling out a load of dough just for a bit of paper. And it's like, here, you've really gone out of your way to, uh, you know, I could imagine that if, um, you know, if, if Jane is showing these to somebody and they're wavering, she, she would say, oh, yes, and, you know, we throw in a blob of blue tack as well so you can hang them up at home. You really, you really do like this, um, this, well, I'd call it this kind of down-home style, don't you? Yes, I do, and in, I, I get a little tired of labels in the same way ha, the idea of how a photo book should be or the idea of how a photo show should be is terribly limiting. And when you have uh, the good fortune like me to work with a publisher like Steidl and to work with a gallerist like Jane Hamlin, then all this is possible. And so it's very rare these days to go to a gallery or to go to a museum and see a beautiful sea print with no glass in front. Mm. Um, and I thought this is really one uh, environment where one can do that. Yeah. And, you know, if for uh, someone needs to frame it, then it'll get framed. But I also like... Um, just the simulation a little bit of the Polaroid white around the image. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this gloss, this would, this would be very difficult when it had, it would be very different with glass in front. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I talked about the way that that 
that picture in Delhi a Airport was so big. And you know, one of the kind of key things for me that um, that I've read about art and photography generally is actually something that a question that Updike asks of a, I think it's of a photograph, and he says, you know, does this picture earn its size? Hmm. And you know, these are you know these are pretty small by contemporary standards. I think there are just two that you've done. You, you've done uh, done big. There's the red one and, and, and the green one, and I just you know maybe you could say something about what, what you know what, what made you think that those two particularly earned their size. I mean I think there's a tendency in, you know, photographers now they'll so often you know you take a picture of I don't know let's say a, uh, you know a uh, cheese and egg sandwich in one of those little triangular things and it's well, it just looks like a so blow it up big, um, you don't. You know, you, you really... Uh, I, I, pr I prefer doing the opposite, yeah. which is to see how small yeah. can it work. <laughs> or send a letter. Can mm, someone even pass smaller. me my box? Yeah. Um, and so these, this is actually a big size for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for a few years now, I've printed 10 inches by 10 inches. And yeah. these were seeming... Oh, yes. Could I have the box? Yeah. There's a... She's gone huge with these, <laughs> you can see, yeah. Um, Thank yeah. you. Um, and so those particular, those two, I thought really gained from being in that large size. Mm. And it's coming back to that music, uh, what I was saying about having learned from the musicians. So instead of going just a little bigger, to always go just a little smaller. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Um. I think that's, uh, let's see, okay, yeah, we are, we've kind of gone a little bit over time, actually. Um, On that ghostly yeah. note, <laughs> I want to thank you both for a fascinating conversation, and thank you all.